and Station Houston on two for Mike. If you're ready, we can go ahead and get started. You bet. I was born ready. Okay, we'll pass you in now. <laughs> Howdy, this is Mike Fossum. Am I talking to Aggieland? Howdy! Okay, who do we have on that end? This is N.K. Anand, I'm the Interim Dean of Engineering, and we have our uh, students from Aerospace, Mechanical, and across the college. Pleased to have you, sir. Oh, that's great. That's great. No, it's my honor to, uh, to speak to you and the students. It, this is something I've wanted to do for a, a long time, and really it's, it's a great for me to, to share this experience of being up here with you guys. We appreciate it, and students have lined up here to ask you questions, if it is all right with you. <laughs> Great. Yeah, let me just start off with, uh, with a couple of quick things. Yeah, first of all, I, you know, I am uh, Mike Fossum, class of 80. I was a mechanical engineering student uh, at A&M and a proud member of the uh, Corps of Cadets went into the military and I worked as a, a flight test engineer. I worked for a period of time as, a, as an engineer at NASA Houston in the very early days of the space shuttle program. And that's when my dream of uh, flying in space started to become more real. It's one I'd had since childhood. And I started to realize that astronauts weren't gods. They're really a lot more like normal people. Some are more normal than others. And uh, that kind of lit me up and caused me to uh, work harder to achieve this dream. But I just, I'm really glad to share the day with you and, and answer questions. This is our time. It is public going out to the world. So just to let you know that too. <laughs> Howdy. My name is Andrew Marshall, and I'm, um, and I'm a mechanical engineering major like yourself. And my question is, um, Hi, howdy, I'm working on an engineering design project whose goal is to create a system that allows astronauts on the ISS to add specific amounts of additives to beverages like sugar and creamer to coffee. Now, as an astronaut, are there any particular suggestions or perspectives you could offer? I need to get some video to you. Uh, some of my comrades up here like to add uh, sweetened condensed milk to coffee, and that's a trick. Uh, on the U.S. side, okay. our, our beverage containers basically have kind of like a large bore needle that goes through a septum to fill it with the proper amount of, uh, of uh, water, hot or cold water, and it, the, the coffee is already pre-mixed, the powdered coffee uh, is pre-mixed with the cream and the sugar in there. But they like uh, like to make it more like, a, they, you know, call it the uh, the Starbucks coffee. And the Russian uh, beverage containers use a different, whole different kind of thing where it's kind of a cone-shaped nozzle and a, and, a, and a receptacle on the plastic drink bag that you cut it, an opening and you slide it over the nozzle, hold it tight. And uh, we use that and actually use a, a, a syringe to fill with the sweetened condensed milk and inject it into the coffee bag. Uh, and then add the hot water and mix it up. Uh, it, it, that's what you do when you're bored and you want to uh, play with your food, I guess. <laughs> it, it's an interesting, uh, interesting project because everybody has their own taste for uh, for coffee and what they like with them, and they're actually fairly expensive to make. Uh, it, the actual bag of coffee go through. It's a whole lot more than if you went by it at a commercial place and bought it. And so they have to launch this coffee black, coffee cream, coffee with sugar, 
coffee with cream and sugar, coffee with cream and artificial sweetener. And okay. you don't know, it, it, we can't just run down to the store and pick up more when we run out of the kind we like. And so there would be some advantages to, to being able to dial in. I like black coffee. Uh, I've gone through a lot of the black coffee in our immediate stores, and so I've been working on uh, acquiring a taste for coffee with other things in it. Uh, and uh, it would be kind of nice if I could just dial in the black coffee without adding other stuff. So good luck with the project. All right. Thank you very much. Howdy. My name is Alejandro Azakar, and I am a sophomore aerospace engineer. And what I'm wondering is what advice you have for another Aggie who also wants to become an astronaut. Andra, I wish you well, and I, I want you to hurry up. I need some help in the astronaut corps. There's only one of us here these days, and I take a lot of heat, so I need some help. Uh, and I would say in general is just keep working hard. You know, follow your passion and work really hard. Become the best at what, at, at what you're doing. Uh, and uh, there's, you know, you have to be really, you know, and it, you don't have to work in the space business. We like to bring people in that come from other areas. Having some space experience in some ways is helpful, but it's also great to be, you know, to work, to work hard and become, you know, recognized as an expert in your field. And it takes something like that. Uh, and so hopefully you really like the engineering track you're on and are going to enjoy working in that area in the years ahead. And good luck. Hurry up. Thank you. How's it going, Mike? Um, my name's Bubba, and I'm a computer engineer. And how do you think going to space has changed your perspective on life, and how so? Hey, Bubba. Glad to meet you. My perspective <laughs> on life, you know, that's an interesting one. It's For me, it, you can you can look at that in so many ways. Uh, you know, really, this 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 is now a reality, but it started as a dream when I was 11 years old to watch the moon landing, the first moon landing on Earth, or first moon landing, and and then you know it, it, within a year or two I started thinking about you know, like every red-blooded kid on the planet, you know, I, mean, I want to do that, but I didn't really think it could come true. I, I did not have the faith, and I, I, you know, as as kids do, dreams kind of come and go. And this one always stayed in the back of my mind, but I, I couldn't shake it completely, and I also couldn't accept that it, it in any way could become real. And I think that, that you know, achieving this for me, it was a, this was a really long shot for a kid from the Rio Grande Valley, and a kid from anywhere really, and that it was just such an uh, such an incredible long shot. And to be able to you know, be fortunate enough to, you know, to be living and working here right now is just about beyond comprehension. But it goes to show that anything really is possible. You have to stick to it. You have to believe in it. You have to work hard, reach, you know, always find ways to reach and to knock down, go around, or climb over barriers that are in your way. But it can happen. And so I think in that just big sense of, of the reality of dreams that can come true is, is a big one. Awesome, dude. Thanks. <laughs> Howdy. I'm Zach Anderson. I'm a freshman aerospace engineering major. And I was curious, how has been a member of the Corps of Cadets help you in your life and your career, sir? Howdy, Zach. Uh, to me, to get, you know, joining the Corps, and some of you have heard this story before, perhaps, was almost on a whim. I needed a dorm room. Dorms were full. Apartments were too expensive. I had hair down to my shoulders. If you join the Corps, you got a dorm room. And so I was sold. And I, that's, a, that's absolutely a true story. And you know, I got in not knowing what I was getting into. I did not. I, I had only visited A&M a couple of times. When I visited it the first time, I knew that's where I wanted to go to school. But I didn't know how I was going to make it happen. And this is kind of an example of what it took, because I, I tried things, tried to get the dorms, tried to find an apartment, tried to find some way to finance it, and it wasn't there. So I had only one up, and I went for it. And it was life-changing for me. Uh, joining the Corps of Cadets was a, was a great experience. I made friends there that are, have been friends for life. And I went in with absolutely no intention of going in the military. I found out that you know, the military had all kinds of opportunities to offer. 
and great experiences, not to mention just the satisfaction of serving our country. And so the, the being in the Corps really woke me up to all of those possibilities and opened up a, a, a complete progression of life events that really got me here today. Because again, when I went to a &M, I didn't I had no intention of going in the military, but really for me, one of the keys was working as a flight test engineer and having the flight experience in the Air Force that gave me a skill set that happened to be something that matched up with with, uh, with skills that NASA needed for this kind of job. But I wouldn't I would not be here today if it wasn't for you know having taken that fateful fateful step, cut my hair, and join the Corps. Thank you, sir. Hello, Mr. Fossum. My name is Franco Batati, and my question is. I know there are many, but I'm very curious what your opinion is. What do you think is the primary benefit of human space missions for those of us here on the ground? You know, that's a really good question. I, I think in a really big way, I mean, there's, there's, there's the pure science that we're doing up here, and it's really exciting. Uh, you know, the International Space Station started as a, the, the, the largest engineering integration project ever ever attempted. Fifteen nations have come together to build this laboratory, almost, almost a million pounds in orbit, you know, 240 miles above the Earth. These, these, and look at the list of the countries. We haven't always been close friends at, with these countries. So this has been a, a really huge undertaking uh, around the globe that's really brought us together in a lot of ways. At the, at the same time as an engineering project, get it built was one aspect. And now we're in the scientific phase where we're finally built. Space shuttle's job is done, and the space shuttles, of course, have been retired. And now we're moving from the assembly into the science and utilization. And a lot of what we do, we're doing is just the pure science. Uh, you know, you, you know the, the basics of the convective heat transfer and all those kind of things where you have the buoyancy effects and all, which we don't have here. And from the material science point of view, it's fascinating the kind of research that you can do. And right above the camera that you're looking out of right now is a furnace that does exactly those kind of, uh, of test runs. Uh, just right here, another facility that's a combustion facility. And without the, the, the uh, buoyancy effects on the flame, they're, we're running flames in different atmospheres and really getting into the detailed physics of the flame to understand the, what's going on in the, the really details and finding the flame boundaries for different conditions. And you know from the engineering problems, finding the boundary conditions, establishing the true boundary conditions is crucial for finding the, the real answer to a, a real world problem. That, that aren't as neat as they come in the textbook. So that's the kind of just cutting edge research that we're doing in the material science and physics, uh, you know, in a lot of areas, there's plant growth. And then there's the human guinea pig aspect where, you know, I'm, I am a test subject for bone studies, cardiovascular studies, muscle, you know, eyes, and a lot of other things associated with long duration space flight. So there's, there's basic learning there. There's one more. And it's really huge, and it's really simple, and that's the pioneering spirit. You know, as Americans, we've we our entire history one of coming to the shore and looking west and looking for the next opportunity that lies just beyond what you can see, and that's a part of our psyche, part of who we are. And and I think it's important for us to maintain that kind of edge because it is what has made us a great country and continuing to look at the world that way, to look at opportunities that way. And this is one of those ways. Space is another frontier. We're pioneering space now as we learn how to live and work here and we establish the, the, the foundation for bigger things for the future. That's what it's all about. Thank you very much. Howdy, Mr. Fossum, sir. My name is David Wilson. I'm a junior engineering technology major focusing on electronics. And my question for you is, what advice do you have for undergraduates? And what's your favorite space gadget? Oh, that's good. Uh, howdy, David. Glad to meet you. The, uh, the, my advice for undergraduates is, you know, so much of the time we're worried about grades. You know, you're you know, you're worried about grades. If you're, you know, if you're one of the, uh, you know, one of the uh, one of the fighters that's trying to trying to stay in school, 
You, of course, are worried about grades. Your parents are worried about grades when they get the reports and they want to know how things are going, and that's to be expected because uh, they're making an investment in helping you through this. But it's not about grades. It's really not. It's about learning, and you have to approach it that way. And, and of course, you've got to knock the classes off, but you have to be thinking about them and how they fit together with the other things because what you're trying to do during this, this four years or rather five years is, is build a tool set that you can use. You're filling a box, a toolbox full of tools, and you need to know how they all work together to go out and solve real problems that aren't neatly defined by textbooks and class projects. And it requires critical thinking, and it requires you to understand the different tools that you have at your disposal. And so go at it with a passion, not to get the A, a passion to learn and to understand the concepts that you're dealing with here and how they fit together. That's my, uh, my best advice for right now. Thank you, sir. Uh, could you also tell me what's your favorite gadget in space? My favorite gadget in space, uh, it, it has to be. The, it's a it's a big one. It's the uh, it's the EMU. It's the spacesuit that we use to do spacewalks. And I've uh, I've done seven spacewalks now, and uh, that's a pretty cool gadget to be outside in your own. Really, it's a spaceship. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Michael Vanesky. I'm a sophomore aerospace engineering major, and my question is: uh, Do you believe that the private space industry will play a large part in the future of manned space exploration or that there will be a return to government funded uh, projects once we get some of our own economic issues back here and it's sort sorted out, sir. Hey, Michael, we could talk all, all, uh, all afternoon and evening about that one. I think the private space industries are here to stay. Uh, they're in this, uh, in this business in a really big, really serious way. There's a lot a confusing number of them that are, to, to me anyway, because I've been heads down training for years here. But there's a there's a lot of action going on. There's a lot of people with a lot of ideas, and they're 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 making things happen. They are building rockets, and they are launching spaceships. Uh, there's uh, several that are right on the verge of being able to launch a commercial cargo ship to the space station, and uh, they're they're working act working to get a human launch capability. I think that there's definitely a role for the government in this, too. It's a little hard to say yet what the business model might be, and I am certainly no expert in this, and I'm not a NASA space policy kind of guy. But if NASA is your only customer, then, you know, I, I don't understand why we make real big departures from the ways we've done it in the past. So I think NASA is going to be continuing to work and develop things, too. Uh, there, there are some uh, some uh, some some progress made in that arena, and uh, it'll, you know, time will tell. There's a lot of great ideas, a lot of smart people working very hard that are have highly motivated, and that's a very fertile opportunity to make things happen, come up with new ways of doing business, you know, smart ways of getting things certified, and maybe, you know, sometimes the government moves kind of slow. Uh, and, and the private industry has the uh, advantage of not having the kind of government, you know, bureaucracy you have. Uh, but some of that also, you know, uh, there have been trade-offs through the years as we've learned some hard lessons. So it's going to be interesting to see. I think both are going to be involved. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, howdy, Mike Fossum. I'm Nick Zias. I'm a freshman aerospace engineering major. And I just wanted to ask, uh, how is it like living in space for an extended period of time? Howdy, Nick. It's it's really amazing to live up here for an extended period of time. Uh, my first two missions were space shuttle missions to the space station, so I visited here. Those missions were two weeks. At two weeks, you know, you're going uh, full out full weeks because you only have Know, a certain, a very short amount of time to get a big job done, uh, and and you don't have much time to look out the window and really enjoy being here. You also don't really fully adapt to living and working here. So to me, the the advantage of living up here for the long haul is, you know, I I, I am a creature of space now. My body is fully adapted. Uh, my reflexes have changed. I can do a lot of 
grab it with just my feet, not touching with my hands to grab onto handrails and stuff because you learn where the handrails are. The other day we were working over here right behind me and had to move some stuff and it ended up displacing one of the handrails. It's really a foot rail. And it was funny to watch guys come in and try to stop the computer and go out of control because the handrail they're used to uh, sticking their foot under wasn't there anymore. And so you, you really adapt up here. Uh, the other thing that's, that's great about it is there's a little more time. We do get most of the weekends off. We do some voluntary science on the weekends, and there's always housekeeping, uh, literally, to clean, keeping the place clean uh, and things like that. But there's more time to look out the windows and to really just live it, to experience it, and to enjoy it. And uh, it's been a great experience for me. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Howdy, Mike. Paul Schattenberg. My question to you is, uh, in your opinion, what is the single most important experiment uh, conducted on the International Space Station, and how might that be a benefit to us here on Earth? Well, howdy, Paul. It's good to talk to you in person, not just straight emails. I look forward to talking to you tomorrow, <laughs> too. Uh, I think the, uh, the, the, the number one that actually you, you've stumped me here. What would that be? <laughs> I, I think it's the many things that we're able to study in the human body very quickly. Uh, osteoporosis is an absolute threat for me, uh, for uh, for humans up here in the microgravity, because uh, you know I'm floating right now, and the, my bones aren't doing any work to help support my frame, and that that. Osteoporosis starts, the process of calcification of the bone starts within hours of reaching zero gravity. And so what takes place in the human uh, on Earth over the course of decades, particularly, you know, elderly women, you know, takes place in us in the course of weeks and months uh, very, very quickly, and it, uh, it can be dangerous. And so we have, you know, we're the guinea pigs for uh, medicines and exercise regimens to help maintain, you know, that uh, that bone mass. And I, I think that that, that has the uh, you know, immediate payoffs. There's also, there's a lot of things having to do with medicine uh, and material science. And I just, I couldn't, I couldn't narrow those down to just one. Hey, no worries. Thanks. See you tomorrow. Okay, talk to you tomorrow. And everybody that's interested in uh, talking tomorrow, come out the Aggie uh, Ham Club. Uh, howdy, Mr. Fossum. I'm Thomas Dowell, a freshman aerospace engineer here. And earlier you spoke of private industry and space flight and how the ISS was this massive project with many nations involved in it. Do you think that in the future private industry and government organizations could work together on a similar project? Howdy. The, I, you know, we, we talk about it, and it, for the U.S. part of the station and really for the entire station, even the parts that were built in other countries, it was private contract that did the building. So NASA didn't build much of the hardware that you see around me right here. This is the U.S. laboratory that we're in right now, the central part of the U.S. part of the station, and it was all built by contract. And so to say contract versus NASA, it, it's – you know, it, it gets a little mixed. You know, NASA was the prime contract. NASA was in charge of the project, but we had a prime contract worked for NASA with NASA, and really at all the important boards, space station program. There were two chairs of those boards. You know, a NASA chair and a Boeing chair, and they worked together, and and you know, kind of came to a unanimous agreement on things uh, as we were working through it, and so. It, in a case like this, where you're building a national and international and world facility, that's the realm of governments, uh, because there's no payoff in it for a private company. The, the, the reason the private companies want to get into the launch business is that they, they believe that there's a market to launch you know, people into space that have nothing to do with NASA. The, the people that want to go up for an orbit, go up suborbital hop, they see space with their own eyes. Uh, go up and, and do an orbit, come home, or go up and even have other facilities, separate facilities than this. That's the space hotel is a concept 
being worked on in several quarters. Uh, and they, they believe that there's going to be a market for that in the next 5, 10, 20 years. And so they, you know, the, the partnership with NASA to get people to and from the space station, they leverage then for a launch capability for these kind of other commercial uh, opportunities that have nothing to do with NASA and our human spaceflight program. Thank you, sir. Howdy, sir. My name is Fatma Ismail. I'm a senior geophysics major, uh, and I was wondering how much time does it take you to adapt to life on space, and how do you adapt to life back on Earth because you're being confined to gravity and such? Well, there's, I think the adaptation to zero gravity or microgravity up there is actually a lot easier. You learn fairly quickly how to handle yourself. I was still adapting after two months, though. I noticed that I was all of a sudden moving a little more smoothly through things, and even three months, as small adjustments in how I, I just work up here. Uh, the the adjust and and for me the adjustment coming up fairly easy. I, I don't have any real s uh, symptoms or, or issues with coming up. Some people have, you know, there's different things that can happen uh, that as part of the transition from, you know, 1G to 0G. Uh, this, your spine stretches. The disc between the vertebrae and your back stretch a little bit because they're not being compressed every day, and that can cause back pain and stuff like that. Going home is a story, though. Uh, that that's, uh, that's harder, and you find out that gravity really stinks. Uh, as you know, we work out a couple hours a day, uh, resistive training and uh, 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 cardiovascular training, aerobic training. Uh, so we, we don't lose all of our muscle mass and we keep our bones healthy. Uh, but just the balance, reestablishing balance. And right now our blood, the cardiovascular system, our blood is a lazy circle. The heart doesn't have to work at all to keep blood from my lower leg all the way up my brain and, and move it around. On Earth, you have a series of valves in your legs that help the check valves. When the heart pumps that blood a little ways and the check valves keep it from cooling back down. And those all get, from lack of, they get, uh, they, they don't work as well at first. And you've got to retrain even some of those autonomic responses in your body to work again. And so the adaptation, the big adaptation is in the first uh, week or so. And my friends tell me that they're feeling close to normal after about a month. Thank you, sir. Howdy. My name is Amanda Couch, and I'm an electrical engineering major. And I was wondering how you felt uh, your time at Texas A&M helped prepare you for a career in space. Howdy, Amanda. You know, in, in a lot of different ways. One was just the exposure to the, to, the, to the engineering and the technology and, you know, a bunch of just amazing professors who, you know, encouraged and pushed and beat on us and whatever it took to help us learn was a, was a big part of it. Uh, for me, too, the experience, you know, equal to that was really the, the community experience, the, 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 the working with my friends and studying with buddies and kind of a teamwork thing. And we learned that, of course, people in the core learn that you're living with a group that you have to learn how to get along with and, uh, you know, in kind of a confined space. Uh, but even across the camp, the real feeling of teamwork and camaraderie uh, that, that, that showed up in so many ways is just part of the Aggie spirit. And I think that that's really important because, you know, right now I'm the only American up here. My two crewmates are from Russia and from Japan, and we're, we're very different people. And, and, you know, we don't even have – well, we're very different people, but we get along great. And part of, you know, part of this experience for me was just learning how to get along with people at A&M, get along with people that were different than me, and, and learning the value, putting the value in the teamwork – and, and you know, playing well with others, and and to really just value that that time with your friends. My my buddies are waiting for me right now because we're going to have dinner together, uh, and they're they're not going to start dinner until I'm done, so we can all you know have dinner together because that's something that we do up here. We make a point of doing, and, and so you know, in, that you're there at A&M for the college degree, but there's more to it than that. You know, enjoy the whole experience of being an Aggie and and the the friendships, the camaraderie, the spirit, and everything else that comes with being there. Thank you very much.
Hello, sir. I'm Vignesh Sridhar from Computer Engineering. I just wanted to ask from your perspective, uh, how would the ISS be beneficial in manned explorations to Mars? Is it playing a very critical factor in such things? Oh, absolutely. It's it's huge. Well, one is you've got to keep humans healthy. This is a uh, five and a half month, almost six month mission, and so you know they they under controlled conditions. And if something goes wrong, we you know we literally back on the surface of the Earth in in uh, you know less than two hours. Eh, that's pushing it some, but in less you know four to five hours, we could be on the surface of the Earth, and we could we could get somebody home if we needed to. Uh, the moon. Where we've been before, and I think we'll go again, is only three days away using standard uh, propulsion systems and things like that. Three days away. So, as we saw with the, you know, the famous incident on Apollo 13, they, something went wrong and they were just a few days away and they managed to find a way to limp it back home. And, uh, you know, a lot of really bright people worked hard and pulled some miracles. But, you know, again, it was not, it wasn't uh, quite as bad. Mars. Standard technology today, which we can see for rocket propulsion, is like seven to eight months one way. And once you get there, you need to be healthy enough, and you need to. It's it's a huge investment to get there, and you need to uh, you know have time to get work done the the real exploration. Not to mention, you really need to wait. You can't just go to Mars from Earth the time you want to. The Earth and Mars need to be lined up to be advantageously get there. Uh, with the least amount of fuel and time, and then they have to be lined up to make that trip back home. So you're really talking a two-year trip to go to Mars, you know, to and from Mars. Okay. Here we have a cargo ship visit us on a regular basis. We shut the hatches on a cargo ship today. We filled it full of trash, and it's leaving tomorrow, and it's going home, sort of. It's going to be a really impressive shooting star over the Pacific. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and then another one's going to launch in a few days and come up and uh, you know automatic dock base station. If you're on the way to Mars, you have to take everything with you. Uh, you can conceptualize most of the stuff that you need to take to Mars with one exception. That's water. Two years worth of water is still going to weigh one kilogram per liter. There's no way to dehydrate it or compress it or anything else. And it's it's really huge because we need a certain amount of water every day to stay healthy. You've got to have a closed loop water system to as as closed as you can make it. You need to recover that water, and that system. And we use it. We have one right now. I mean, our the uh, where's my drink bag? I mean, the water we're drinking right now was urine yesterday. That's the fact because we recycle it, turn it back into drinking water. Uh, we recover the condensation out of the uh, air conditioning system, and that goes back into the purification system, too. So when we breathe and we sweat, water evaporates pick up that way. And uh, Now, that, that kind of system will be critical for Mars, and you have to have a system that's reliable enough that it will operate to and from without getting some kind of out of control, mold, slimes, uh, bacteria growth in this system that takes it out of commission. Because if you lose your water system on the way to Mars or the way home, you're dead. So we are like this, the carbon dioxide removal systems, the oxygen generation systems. Uh, and we're doing some a little bit of work on plant growth because we think it will be important for crews to have some, some plants. I don't think you'll be able to grow enough to make it significant amount of your diet It'll be an important thing to see, just a little bit of green on that long inner, inner, uh, time in between planets. Thank you for your insight, sir. Howdy, sir. My name is Jenny Brewer, and I'm currently an aerospace engineering student. And I was curious, how important is it to learn a foreign language, and have you had any difficulty communicating across language barriers or cultural barriers? Howdy, Jenny. Oh, yes. I, I really think it's, it's hugely important, and and I'm like most Americans. It is not my strength, and it's in, it's embarrassing sometimes. Uh, you know, growing up in the valley, I, I grew up being exposed to uh, Spanish uh, down there, and that was uh, a real blessing. Uh, up here, 
uh, we use a combination operationally uh, for the space station. I mean, English is theoretically the the, uh, the language of space station, but the reality is we're also launching on Russian Soyuz rockets, and so you need uh, some amount of, uh, of the Russian language also. Uh, I think learning any language at the earliest age you can help enable your brain to stay more flexible and accept there's other ways, there's other words for this, there's other ways to express these concepts, and, and it'll help you later. One of the joys, I mean, I, I love, the mission is great. I, I'm, I'm just loving every minute of it. But the two and a half years of training to get here was something I dreaded. I really thought it was going to be horrible, and it wasn't. The travel was, was hard. Being away from my family as much as I was was very hard. But there was also a benefit of traveling around the globe and training in Japan, in Germany, in Canada, and a lot in Russia, uh, and, and getting to know those people uh, and getting to know, you know, I've, I'll never be, certainly never uh, be able to even get, get by in, in Japanese, but I can, I can get around a little bit in Germany and I can get around in Russia. And learning some of the language helps you really know the people better, helps you know the place better, and helps you know our planet better. It's really important. I encourage everybody to. Mike on two, just a heads up, right, four you, minutes sir. to your LOS. Okay. Thank you, sir. I'm sorry, we, uh, that we that broke in. We just have a little less than four minutes left, so that's a good heads up. I'm ready for the next one now. Howdy, my name is Eric Anderson. I'm a freshman aerospace engineering major. And what do you think of Texas A&M going to the SEC? <laughs> I think it's going to make things really interesting. Uh, I kind of born leaving behind our, you know, some of the, the teams that we have played for, you know, generations uh, from the old Southwest Conference. Big 12, and I'm going to miss playing. Uh, I, I'm, I'm absolutely going to miss uh, playing the uh, annual games with those teams because I have a lot of friends from those schools, and and it's always a you know good bowl for us. We have a lot of fun with that every year, giving each other a hard time, and so I'm going to miss that. But it's uh, I think it's it's exciting times with the SEC, and I look forward to it. Right, thank you. Um, howdy, Mr. Fossum. I'm Ash Fernando. I'm an aerospace engineering freshman myself. Um, my first question is, um, how often do you use your thrusters on the spaceship, and how, what effect does that have on um, your experiments? And um, the second question is, how do you do your laundry? <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll do the thrusters first. The, uh, actually, we just use the thrusters just periodically to bump up our altitude because we actually have a little bit of atmospheric drag here. It's not much, but it's enough to drop us a few meters a day, tens of meters, I'm not even sure the number. Uh, and we, we've done two reboosts in the last couple of weeks. We did one two days ago. Uh, I think if you get on NASA YouTube, you, you might be able to find some video that we took of it on board to show as we're floating in space, we're at a constant speed, right, because we're in orbit. And we're floating just, just like this in the cabin, and the, the ship starts accelerating away from us, pushing us back that way. It was really – and uh, we don't do that – I mean, we just do that periodically to adjust the orbit a little bit or, uh, or to maneuver away from a bit of space debris. Um, but it, it, it's not that much. And there was a second part of your, your maneuvering question. Um, the maneuvering question? The laundry. The laundry question. How do you do your laundry? Okay, I, I thought something else about the rockets. Uh, laundry, we don't. We wear them until they're ready to throw out. Uh, we were back uh, 15, 18, 20 years ago, we were working on the space washing machine, and, man, it is comp really complicated. We don't have a space shower either uh, because it, trying to get the water to go where you want it to go is just hard the resources, and water is one of those critical resources, right? So you, you just you wear it until it's time to throw out. Now, the place is very dry. Uh, it's very it's cool. It's uh, air conditioned really well. We, you know, we change into gym clothes twice a day to work out, and we clean up after that. And so you're not, you know, you're not like wet clothes out. 
classes and things like that. But, you know, I only have so many Aggie shirts, and i got to take care of it. Thank you very much, sir. Howdy, Mike. My name is Claire. I'm a freshman hey guys, physics major, I better... and I just wanted to ask, what's your favorite thing? What was your favorite thing about flying on the space shuttle? Uh, my favorite thing about flying on the space shuttle was was, you know, the, really the launch, and then looking, which is just an incredible ride, and then looking out of the windows for the very first time to see what it was like to see the Earth from space. And not a video, not a picture. My eyes looking through. <laughs> Bye, Mike. <laughs> well, thank you for coming, and you know, we'll say bye to Mr. Fossum. So, hopefully, he's hearing us. <laughs>